there's economic reasons to do a transaction and there's quality of life reasons and you need to determine like what's the most important to you at this phase of your career sometimes it could not be a great economic outcome in terms of the valuation but if your quality of life is so much better you might want to move ahead anyway Welcome Model FAs. My name is David DeSell, president with the Model FA, and I'm very excited for our guest today, Alan Darby. So Alan is a good friend of ours here in the industry. And just to start off with his quick bio. So Alan has been in the wealth management industry for three decades. Uh, to put that into perspective, I've been uh, alive for three decades. So Alan's got a bunch of experience under his belt. And you know, he started off and founded a highly successful firm that was one of the pioneers in helping assist accounting firms get into the wealth management business. I know that there's a lot of that going on right now. In 1999, he sold that enterprise to First Global Inc. out of Dallas, Texas, and subsequently founded a successful RIA in Charlotte, North Carolina. With his own RIA, he conducted nine mergers and acquisitions and eventually sold his practice in 2009 in order to focus his expertise in the M&A area. So we're going to be talking a lot about M&A here today. Then in 2012, Alan took a role in United Capital on their new partnership team as a buyer advisor for United. He led a team that sourced acquisition candidates for the firm. During his tenure with United, he sourced and closed 32 acquisitions. He has a lovely wife, Joanne, of 29 years, and two children, Trevor and Alana. And he's currently residing in Cornelius, North Carolina. Alan, it's been a pleasure getting to know you. Welcome to the show. Yeah, David, I appreciate it. I'm looking forward to it. Thanks for having me on. So give me a sense. I want to go through a little bit of your background. So were there any other industries that you had a hand in before joining the financial services, you know, post, you know, schooling and stuff like that? Or did you immediately get into financial services? No, right out of school. Was it uh, 1990, 1991? And the economy was just in shambles at that point. So I was a biology major in college. So I wasn't, I really wasn't intending on getting into the business of financial services, I was actually going to go towards the medical profession or be a pharmaceutical sales rep. And uh, so I, I I remember my first job interview, there was like 800 interviewees for it. So wow. needless to say, and so that's, uh, I took a few gigs. One was as a radio salesperson. I think I sold credit card machines. I did just about anything we could to put food on the table. I got married when I was 22. So I had to start providing, you know, at that early age. And so I I did a few things, but ultimately uh, got into the insurance business. That was kind of my entrance into the financial services Mm -hmm. world was through the risk management side. And, uh, you know, then got my securities license and so forth. That was how I got into the business period. It definitely didn't start out intending to be in the financial services industry for sure. What, uh, What firm did you start at? So my first uh, significant, I guess, job was with Wachovia yeah. Securities. Yeah. So I was actually a uh, what they called a personal investment counselor, managing investments and doing a little bit of planning, but it was more, seemed like it was more product pushing at that point at like eight bank branches. So uh, I remember, I, th- I think I had a few thousand clients and managed a few hundred million dollars as a 24 year old, 25 year old, you know? And so I, I remember asking my manager, like what, you know, I, all these people that I'm working with, how am I going to develop a relationship with? There's too many. I like, you know, I need to get involved with them and learn what their values are and all the rest. And he said, you don't understand. We don't want you to build a relationship with them. We want you to sell, you know, <laughs> these products. So I learned I was in the business, but I was at the wrong place. I gotcha. Now, I guess what attracted you? So, you, know, you transitioned, you know, from, you know, a firm that uh, was helping accounting firms get into the wealth management business, and then in starting your own RIA, you started getting into the M and A space. Um, so, was there like a dual component of some decent organic growth as well as M and A growth, or were you primarily focused on M and A? You know, back when you started that. No, we were focused on organic growth uh, primarily. 
And as you mentioned, we were, we were actually buying some accounting firms with the intent of leveraging wealth management into the space. And so my first real foray into M&A was looking at buying an accounting firm, mm-hmm. you know? And so that's how I got familiar with it. And it was, I considered it very successful, but uh, that's when I met Joe Duran at United, when he first started United Capital. I want to say I was, if maybe they'd done one acquisition, but it was either zero or one. And they were talking to us about acquiring our firm. Mm-hmm. And so I met Joe very early into his career at United. And because we were buying accounting firms, they didn't want to acquire our practice because that wasn't something they were into. And he gave me the advice of why don't you just, if you want to you know, grow your wealth management business, why don't you just start buying wealth management practices or financial planning practices? And so I thought that's a good idea. So, so we started, <laughs> that's when we started to just buy a, a wealth management practices. So we did a few of those as well. How have you seen the M&A space change over the years? So, you know, based on my math, right, you joined and, or excuse me, I should say, you started your RIA in what, 1999 or like 2000 when you got out of yeah, it was um, around, the other business? It was, a, it was just after the uh, internet, you know, market crashed. So that was when I started. And I, I'd say we'd, we made our first acquisitions probably around 2004. You know, cool. So call it, it's been, you know, 20 years, right? Give or take. Have you seen much of a change in how m and is working from when you sourced your first deal compared to sourcing your last deal? Yeah, it's, it's not even remotely similar in any aspect of it, really. It's uh, the market has just evolved. It's one, it's, it's much more popular, obviously, today than it was back then. Not that transactions weren't getting done, but it's certainly not at the volume that we see today. And so I would say the, just the sheer interest in it has increased. Models have evolved. I mean, back then, I would even say there was a real model. It was right. just the wild, wild west, more or less. And so we've, and it was more local or regional based. There weren't really any firms that were doing acquisitions at a, on a large national type scale. So yeah, I would say it's, it's definitely evolved. It's gotten much more sophisticated, a lot more capital, a lot more buyers in the space than there was. Seems like everyone's a buyer today. Right. Whereas back then there just wasn't many. Yeah. I feel like there's a lot of people doing and trying to do roll ups and, and grow grow that way really. And obviously there's organic growth, but, and market growth, but I find a lot of firms are doing that. I kind of want to do a little, a uh, little bit of a role play. Um, Cause I know that in our last conversation that you had, one thing that you mentioned is you had recently got told and, and you get told this a lot when you're on the phone with someone, once you're done going through how all this works, that people say like, wow, that was the most clear and thorough explanation of a transaction they've ever heard. So Mm -hmm. I want to give people the opportunity to hear that now. So what scenario should we do? Should I be an advisor who's looking to sell my business or should I be an advisor who's looking to buy a business? What, What would be a better scenario to role play? Well, the most common conversation I have is with someone who's uh, interested in, I'll call it a partnership opportunity, which is code for acquisition. But a partnership opportunity uh, is generally what most people are interested to talk to us about. You know, they requested a meeting with me, mostly because we've asked to talk to them, but they want to understand what's this all about? What's the landscape look like? How are deals structured? What things should I be thinking about? How are valuations done? So I would say from the lens of a seller uh, okay. or someone looking for a partnership. Okay. So someone, so I have 150 million. I'm looking to join a larger firm. Correct. Yeah. Okay, cool. So, all right. So in a bit of role play. So, Hey Alan, you know, hope you're doing well. I, as I mentioned on our previous phone call, I feel like I've gotten to a point in my business where in order to truly scale, I need to be a part of something bigger. I don't, necessarily have the vision of like building out this massive team myself or, you know, having this big conglomerate. So I'm at about 150 million right now. I have a portfolio manager on the team as well as an executive assistant. And I'm at the point of, you know, do I hire another advisor? Do I hire more staff people or do I join a larger firm? And 
not leaning towards joining a larger firm. I just, I've never had this conversation before. I quite frankly, I have no idea how this works. So I guess what, what can you share with me just to help educate me on this space? Yeah. Well, the first thing that I would say is that, you know, when you're thinking about transacting with another organization, and again, we're not talking about specific structure yet, but it's essentially an autonomy trade-off, you know, and you make all the decisions in your business today. If you join another organization, you're, you're not going to make all the decisions. You just have to be comfortable with what those decisions you retain are. And so we call that the autonomy trade. And so when you're looking at, all right, what are the things that I need to evaluate in terms of partnering with another organization? I would start there, you know, in trying to identify what you want your life like on the other side, because all of the different acquirers that exist have a unique model. And that model largely orients around this concept of autonomy. And so we have, for example, clients that are highly structured and highly processed and if you're going to join their team, you're essentially saying, I align to their individual worldview and I see what they're doing is valuable and accretive to my business. And I'm willing to adopt their way of doing things. Okay. On the other end of the spectrum, I have clients that are highly entrepreneurial, meaning they're going to centralize some of your stuff that you're doing. Typically it's mm-hmm. the back office, accounting, compliance, technology, But beyond that, they're pretty much going to leave you alone and let you operate as you do today. And then we have everyone in the middle. So there's this spectrum of autonomy that exists out there in these deals. And you need to understand or you need to have a real concrete understanding of what you are willing to live with. And if you start there, you will eliminate a whole host of potential buyers who don't align to what you're looking for. And then the second component of is what are you looking for in terms of an economic outcome? You know, there's a few dominant models that exist. Specifically, there's the full acquisition model where they're acquiring 100% of your business. And then there's a minority acquisition model where they're acquiring a fraction of your business. Each one of those, and everyone tweaks those models, by the way, to, to come up with their unique take on it. But each one of those is designed to produce a different economic outcome. And so you, once you come to grips with what you're looking for on the autonomy spectrum, then you, then you need to focus on what's the economic outcome that you're seeking. And again, once you get fully aware of what they're designed to produce, that will eliminate a whole host of potential buyers too. So I tend to start there with someone who says, hey, we want to explore this, is to explain to them uh, how those two components work, the economic ideal outcome you seek in the autonomy trade. And from there, you need to start understanding what's motivating you in this transaction. And I find that if you look at the, well, all the transactions that I've been a part of anyway, there's three themes that really motivate people to consider partnering. And everyone kind of weights these three buckets of reasons differently. Often, if it's a multi-partner practice, there'll be partners in the firm that have different weightings of these three themes. The first group would be, we call them the monetary drivers of a transaction. Mm -hmm. And that's three elements. That's the, call it the chips off the table. It's a firm who's built a practice. It's got real asset value and they want to monetize some of that. They want to take some cash out of that asset. And so through transacting, they can do that. Then there's a succession issue to deal with. If you've built a practice and you don't have that younger team, that's going to come behind you and ultimately monetize your business, you've got a succession problem. Also, we find even more commonly, if you do have those people on the team, but there's no structure or pathway to facilitate that equity exchange, you still have a succession problem. So transacting with another firm often helps solve that or move that succession issue away. And then, and lastly, in this monetary group is the upside. You know, what's the, do you have a desire to take equity in the acquiring entity? Do you want to retain a portion of your EBITDA that you would monetize later? You know, so those are monetary drivers. Honestly, I don't find those to be the primary drivers in most partnerships. The next big, it's important, by the way, you have to have a market transaction, but that's not usually what's really motivating people. The quality of life would be the next big bucket of reasons. And that's a firm. I think this is where you are, David, based on what you just shared with me, is that you've built a business the business is now taking over your life. You know, you started in the business, 
to help clients, whether it's a planning experience, an investment value proposition. And as you've grown and succeeded, the realities of the business are encroaching on your personal life, your satisfaction, perhaps. You're maybe you're out of capacity. And so that's a quality of life issue. Any firm that's going to acquire you, whether it's a full or fractional, typically they're going to centralize a good bit of the stuff that's weighing you down. So it's all the usual suspects like compliance. You no longer need to outsource compliance mm-hmm. or manage that. You're going to centralize your back office functions, accounting, billing, HR, technology, all of those things that either you or someone on your team is doing are going to largely go away because your new partner is going to centralize that stuff. The next area of quality of life is in the practice management. That's who does what in the office on what days. I find that most entrepreneurs in the wealth management space, while they're really good at working with clients, most of them are really not good at running the business. They do it because they have to, but they're not great at process and practice management and all the things that when you fundamentally look at a business, that's what makes the business work. You know, mm-hmm. And so when you partner with someone, they should be bringing a degree of competence to you in the practice management aspects of it. So it's And it's things that you would go hire a consultant to help you with. But the problem is typically when you hire a consultant, you've got to go back and implement everything. So your new partner should have some internal resources that are going to help you, you know, define roles and responsibilities. They're going to help you manage your team. They're going to help get the rainmakers out of non-rainmaking functions. They're going to help turn generalists into niche specialists. You know, these are practice management. We see that really show up. Uh, we, we track a metric called revenue per employee. Most firms, when we talk to them, are around 300,000 revenue per employee. So if I didn't know anything about you, David, I would go to your website and count the number of pictures on it and multiply it times 300,000. I'd probably be pretty close to your revenue in most cases. Mm-hmm. When you implement practice management, we see that number start to go up to 400, 500 and beyond. That's a quality of life thing. Just getting you out of the stuff that you really don't like. I talked to a firm uh, just this week and he was complaining about just having to manage his team. You know, there are you know, advisors who are spending time banging out emails and complaining that they don't have enough staff and, you know, just going on and on about the reality that he doesn't like managing people. Well, that's right. practice management. That's a quality of life. And then there's access to resources. What does your new partner bring to you in new resources? So all of that's a quality of life. That's where I find the majority of the what drives a partnership. That's where the emphasis is placed is how is this transaction improving my life and you, and this is you, your team and your clients. And then lastly would be growth. What are they doing to help me grow? After they've cleared the decks operationally, they've given me all this new practice management expertise, they've got new resources. How are we gonna use that to now grow the business? Your new partner should have some organic growth or inorganic growth strategy that they're gonna bring to the table. So if you go back through all that, it's what is your autonomy, your desired autonomy? What's the economic model? And then what's motivating you in this transaction? Is it a monetary driver, a quality of life driver, or is it a growth driver? If you get really clear on all of these things, you can go much quicker through the process of who's a good partner for me. So if you were to pose that question as you did, that would largely be what I would explain. And then, and then of course, if we start that's what we do at Alaris is we help you unpack all of those things and get crystal clear on what your ideal scenario would look like. Cool. Hey, Model FAs. I know you're enjoying this conversation, but I wanted to take a quick break to talk to you about the Model FA Accelerator. This is a unique collaboration between us and you where we help you build a financial advising practice that you can be proud of. We focus on the foundational concepts around how to pick a niche or a specialization, how to price your services, how to construct an offer that people are going to buy, and then how to market it and sell it in a way that'll get people to sign on the dotted line and become clients of your firm, all while giving you the information to scale and set up work flows and operational processes that will allow you to reclaim your time and build a practice that doesn't run you. So if you'd like to hear more about that, go to www.modelfa.com forward slash accelerator or www.modelfa.com. Hover over, work with us and click on accelerator. Hope to see you in the program. So out of role play, uh, some follow-up questions to you. It seems like you're helping transact the M&A itself. And it sounds like But I'm getting a sense that because as as you pose those questions to me, I start thinking, well, what do I want my autonomy to look like? Well, what do I want the financial side or the the time leverage and freedom or the growth? Like, what do I want that to look like? And 
I may not have thought about that before. So it seems like you are consultative in nature with them, I would imagine, through conversation. So it seems like you'd be putting in a decent amount of work with me. Like how, whether it's with you or other people, maybe talk about the industry in general and then talk about you specifically. Like how do I compensate you? Is it a percentage of the deal? Is it a retainer? Is it a fee? Like how does the industry work? And then specifically, how do you work? So if you are a seller, let's say you're looking for a partnership opportunity, you might not know what that means yet, but you're open to the conversation. Historically, you've had two routes to go through. You could go try to negotiate one-on-one with a potential partner or buyer. It's perfectly fine. But if you don't know what you're doing, it can be daunting. You know, if you don't understand how deals are structured, how valuations are done, and what are the big boulder items to consider, like we just talked about, then it can be it can be overwhelming to you as a person trying to understand this. And but it can work. There are a number of great national firms who have internal MA teams that are great at you know helping you vet that, but you might have to kiss a lot of frogs along the way to find the right match. The other route is historically you could go hire a seller advisor, what's known as a seller advisor. Typically it's like an investment banking firm or a business brokerage firm. There's a lot of really good ones out there that you can hire to represent you, to help you understand the landscape and some of the things that we talked about. So you have an advocate, an expert on your side that's helping you guide you through this process. I think it's a better route than going one-on-one with a buyer. My only issue, and it's really not that big of an issue, but it's expensive for you. So you'll typically hiring a seller advisor, you're going to pay them a retainer. Depends on the size of your practice that usually dictates that, but $25,000, $50,000 retainer. You'll likely be charged progress, work progress fees as they go through, because it's a multi-month process that you're going to go through. And they'll charge you some just to cover their basic expenses. And they'll charge you a success fee on the back end. Normally, it's a percentage of your valuation. And all in all, it should cost you probably several hundred thousand dollars in total to help you know guide you through that process if you hire a seller advisor. But again, I think it's better but than going one with a buyer. So the way we work, we are what's known as a buyer advisor. So we would actually run a very similar process that you would go through in hiring a seller advisor, except we're compensated by our clients who hire us to find you. Okay. So uh, it's a relatively new model in the business that we think is going to you know, get a lot of traction. The basic bet that you're making when hiring us at Alaris is that we have a diverse client base that's representative of the broad market, you know, all the different cultures and economic models and styles and so forth. And that we're not biased in terms of who you interact with. So, and we're not, we don't, we have one, we do have a, a large number of really good clients and we don't care who you transact with. We just want it to be a good outcome for both our clients and for you. You just have to believe we're not going to influence you to go to one versus another. And we don't, the way we handle that is when we get to that point in the process, we'll show you all of our clients and you pick, you choose the one. We'll, we'll of course highlight the ones we think make the most sense, but you ultimately choose who you start dating. So, Our model as a buyer advisor, we think it gets you to the same place as what you would achieve going to a seller advisor. It's just a better economic outcome. So to answer your question directly, David, if you engage with us and we find a match for you, then it doesn't cost you anything to work with us. You get the similar experience, I think. If we can't find a match for you, we can convert our agreement to that seller advisor construct where there's not a match within our client base now you know, you'll hire us to go find you a match. And then we would work just like a seller advisor at that point. The only difference, we don't charge a retainer because we've done all the work of that. You know, we'll spend easily a solid month with a firm like yours, helping them understand, you know, how this all works, you know, going through that economic model, the autonomy trade and all that. So we work, I think, very similar to a seller advisor. We just, we're hired by the clients. Cool. I have a three-part question. I'm just going to go one at a time. So let's say I'm an advisor and I say to myself, oh, I love the idea of having some autonomy or maintaining some autonomy. I love the idea of getting support on the practice management side. I love the idea of getting some help on the growth side and then come to find out I have, you know, five or $10 million in AUM, right? Mm -hmm. That's obviously a lot different than someone who has, 150 million in AUM. So at what AUM level specifically do you think it makes sense for an advisor to start considering partnering up with a larger entity? Right. So 
That's actually a really good question. I think it's not necessarily AUM based in why you would consider it. Because if you're at five or 10 million and you're already experiencing some of these challenges that, you know, the complexity of the business and yeah. you don't have the time and capacity, then partnering might be a good idea for you now at that size. The question is, is it through an acquisition or not? Because at that revenue size, I mean, if you're, if let's assume it's an average 100 basis point fee you're charging if you're in your clients, you know, you're a 50 to $100,000 producer at that point. Well, yeah. Valuations are generally done on EBITDA or net revenue. And the reality is you likely don't have much net revenue at that size. Right. And so yeah. an acquisition wouldn't wouldn't benefit you, nor would it benefit the buyer because there's just not enough cash flow to buy. There's a lot of fixed costs associated with these transactions that most transactions, and again, this is different by buyer, but I would say around a million in revenue is okay. where it starts to make sense. For both parties, there's enough net income for you to monetize. There's enough that makes it justifiable for them, you know, to go through the process and time. Not that you can't transact below that size, but that's when I think it really starts to make a lot of sense. We've done transactions smaller than that. It just, you know, may not be the impactful valuation that you're looking for. But again, there's economic reasons to do a transaction and there's quality of life reasons. And you need to determine like what's the most important to you at this phase of your career. Sometimes it could not be a great economic outcome in terms of the valuation, but if your quality of life is so much better, you might want to move ahead anyway. Gotcha. Now, second part to this question is, now mind you, I come from the Northwestern space, right? So I was there for seven years, much different, obviously, than the RIA space. And let's say I'm at Northwestern. I've been there. I'll just use my scenario. I've been there for you know seven years and Primarily, I was focused on the insurance side of planning, right? Risk management and didn't do a great job accumulating assets at that time. But I have a book of business of a few hundred clients where there's AUM opportunity or network opportunity as you continue to you know, get introductions from those folks. Am I attractive at all from that model into the independent space as it relates to getting anything for that? Or does it really come down to how much AUM I have? It depends on the buyer, right? So you would just want to find a partner buyer that values that business, not only from a their client value proposition, they embrace risk management like you do. Also, they understand that business. And as a result of their understanding and comfort with that business, they're willing to put a value on it. So most of our clients, I would say, are looking for that AUM-based business. That's yeah. their business. Not that they don't do insurance, but you know, their 90% of their revenue comes from fee- fees. And so a firm like that, who's looking at your business, if you're 70, 80% or higher risk management, that probably wouldn't be a good outcome for you because they don't value that business that much. Mm-hmm. And so they wouldn't put a, a value, if any, on it. However, we also have clients that love risk management. You know, that is like a core part of their business. And they would look at your practice and because of their comfort and familiarity with it, they would put a value on it. So it's somewhat dependent on who you're talking to, but you would, and also what you're looking to do. Like, are you looking to transact with someone and keep that mix, you know, heavily weighted towards risk management? Or are you looking to move into the fee-based side of the house Uh, So you might want to find a firm who puts a value on it, but also gives you the tools and capabilities to move your business towards that fee-based model. Understood. And then the final question to this series of questions. So you've done a number of deals. If I combine what you did at United Capital, as well as what you did in your own RIA, I think it was like 32 and nine, so call it 41, probably a multitude of deals since then, obviously in your business, because well, that's what you do, right? So yep. there's been a, a number of deals that, that you've executed. Uh, from an AUM standpoint, what's the smallest amount of AUM that you've transacted? And what's the largest amount of AUM that you've transacted? Smallest would probably go back to the days when I was buying firms for my practice. Okay. So I think the smallest one I did there was like 50 million or so. Yeah. Maybe 40 or something like that. But around there, largest that I've been a part of would be around, I think a a billion five. 
a billion five. Yeah. Cool. Cool. Kind of the sweet spot is probably that 200 to 400, 500 million dollar size, you know? Yeah. But well, that's when they, you know, people really need to start making a decision of like, well, what am I building here? Right. Am I done growing or do I need to expand the team or do I need to partner up with someone? So it's probably, you know, at that point in time where they really have to start figuring stuff out. Yeah. It's interesting. If you look at the industry, the groupings of firms, it's different asset levels. The majority of them are sub a hundred million, you know, in terms Mm -hmm. of assets Then I see like a grouping around that 250 million range. That's usually someone who's added another partner, you know, so they've gotten up to that level and they kind of group there. There's another grouping around half a billion. That's a two partner firm, two or three partner firm who's made some investment into their infrastructure, Mm -hmm. you know, try to move off that lifestyle practice to an actual business and they group around half a billion, then there's like this gap between a half a billion and a billion, which very few firms ever make it through. Because the reality is to go from a half a billion to a billion, you likely won't make a lot more money on that journey. Right. Your enterprise value is increasing, but you're not taking out much in terms of compensation because you're having to invest it in the business you know, to go to that. And not a lot of people are willing to do that. So when you're thinking about, should I partner or not, sometimes that's a part of the calculus is, do I really want to do the work it takes to go from whatever your level is to that next grouping, that next level? Yeah. Or am I better off partnering with someone who's already built that infrastructure and we can just you know plug into that and not have to fool with it? Awesome. Before I pivot slightly and start talking about your favorite book, are there any questions that I did not ask that you think would be helpful for either a buyer or a seller to know about how M&A works? I guess um, let me ask this question that just came to mind. Sorry. What makes a deal fall through? Like what do people need to be keeping an eye out for so that they can avoid doing all their due diligence just to fumble on the one yard line? Yeah, that's a really good question. So there's a few things. Overwhelmingly, the reason someone starts and stops is they get to this point in the process where they're kind of staring over the cliff you know, and they're just <laughs> the fear of losing control uh, I see. is the overwhelming number one. You know, they get to a point where they just like, you know what, I get all the benefits that you're espousing, you know, in this partnership, but I'm just not willing to take that leap of faith that as a part of your organization, I'm going to feel like an entrepreneur. I'm going to feel like, you know, I'm not just an employee that's being dictated to, you know, and so I want to retain that. And that's the number one fear of losing control. The second thing is I would say they see the boogeyman, <laughs> you know, they, they're dealing with a partner and there's just this fundamental lack of trust and they see they're irrational, let's say, uh, in terms of a variety of things. So fear of losing control, being irrational would overwhelmingly be the number one thing. Um, I think following up on that and to say having the right frame of mind when coming into the process is really important. And in my opinion, it's just being a open-minded to open-minded to new ways of doing things. You know, it's perfectly okay to say in the same sentence, we're proud of what we've built, but we're open to other ways of doing things. You know, that firm that we're considering partnering with, they actually might do stuff better than we do it. And that's not saying that we're not good at whatever we're talking about, but it's just willingness to say, we're open to hearing and vetting the value proposition of this new partner and just keep taking the next step forward. You know, we call it running downhill. You know, there's nothing urgent, you know, there's nothing burning down in their world that's driving the transaction, but they're just willing to explore. They get started and they keep running downhill. And if you do, if you go that, take that route, you know, it's a much more enjoyable process to go through. No one's looking to steal your business. No one's looking to take the entrepreneur that's built this, whatever the, the AUM is, built this great business and turn them into an employee who doesn't have a say in anything. You know, that's just, right. it's an irrational fear. So that would be it. I cool. Think. So pivoting slightly over to, or well not slightly, but totally over to your favorite book. So for everyone listening, as you've heard on prior episodes, 
And it's really a goal of mine to promote learning in our industry. I believe in the saying, you're either green and growing or ripe and rotting. And I find that there's a lot of advisors who become complacent with the new information that they're bringing in and they don't do that. And then there's another category of advisors that when they are consuming information, uh, they tend to stay within the confines of our industry to stay sharp for their clients. But I think that there's so much value in consuming books that are outside of our industry, whether it be from you know uh, tech companies or you know uh, biographies of certain people. So I guess my question to you, Alan, is what book has had the biggest impact on your life, your business to date? I tend to read books that are more intellectual, not pertaining to our industry. Like I don't mm-hmm. I actually get bored reading books about our industry when, when you know, I'm, I'm in it That's every day. Doing. Yeah. I read more articles or podcasts that seems to be more productive. And I like reading books that are kind of like spiritually oriented, you know? So my favorite author is uh, C.S. Lewis. You know, I love reading uh, all of his stuff. And my favorite book that he wrote was a book called The Screwtape Letters. You know, so it's a very interesting take. It's, of course, a spiritually oriented book, but it's through the perspective of a demon who's coaching a a younger, like apprentice demon on how to influence this man uh, over to the dark side. You know, and so I thought that I loved, love that book. When I read it, I've read it probably three or four times. And every time I read it, it still gives me chills, you know, to think about it. But that would be my favorite book if I had to pick one. Love it. I have yet to come across that. So I'm on Amazon right now, scooping up the Audible. So I'll let you know yeah, my thoughts. Like it. done. It's, it's entertaining too. You know, books to hold my attention anymore in this digital age we live in. Right. There has to be a component of entertainment to kind of keep me engaged. And that's what, one of the reasons that I like that book so much. For sure. Awesome, man. Well, let's say I'm a larger firm, right? I got two of the 10 billion in AUM and I'm looking to really up my M&A game or on the other side, let's say, you know, I have a hundred million, 400 million, 300 million, whatever. And I'm considering partnering up with another firm to solve those challenges that we went through towards the beginning of the show. What's the best way to touch base with you? So you can well, you go to my website, alarisacquisitions.com. On there is a contact field. You can put it in and it'll shoot me a note saying that you want to meet or you can email me at uh, Alan, A-L-L-E-N dot Darby, D-A-R-B-Y at alarisacquisitions.com and just reach out to us and uh, we'll get some time on the calendar to have the conversation. Cool. I know uh, for everyone listening, when I was talking to Alan, when we had our debrief call for this podcast, he had mentioned that the prior month he had had about 70 calls with owners of RIAs that want to have conversations around selling their business and, you know, joining other organizations. And the best day that Alan has is when he's talking to people for the first time. So if this is something that you're considering and you want to begin to explore, uh, I think what I've gathered from you, Alan, anyways, is you take more of a consultative approach to the relationships that you have, as opposed to like being super salesy or pushy or trying to put people in a certain category. It's more of a discovery oriented, you know, fact finding experience to figure out what the best fit is for them. So if you're listening and you're considering this, definitely suggest that you reach out to Alan. Great guy. And, you know, clearly from my conversations and hopefully you've gathered from this conversation, he's not only passionate about what he's doing, but you know, pretty competent or in this space, I should say, as well. So for those of you who are listening, as we've been asking on uh, these shows, uh, two things that would be super helpful for us. Number one is if you found value in this, or you know of an advisor or a firm that is considering making some sort of transition, share this episode, give them some context, add some value to them. Even though the value is going to be coming from Alan himself, they're going to associate that value with you for making the connection. So feel free to go ahead and share this episode with some of your peers and colleagues. And in addition to that, if you would be so kind as to leave us a review on iTunes, that would help us out substantially from a visibility standpoint, making sure more of the industry is getting access to this content and getting value from this content. So as a thank you for that, if you simply take a screenshot of that review once it's posted and... Uh, shoot me a text with that screenshot at 
978-228-2338. Again, that's 978-228-2338. What will happen is you'll get a, a quick automated response with a link. Just click that link, enter in your first and last name so I know who it is. It'll get added to my contacts. And then beyond those automated messages, that's the number to communicate with me on. So if you have any one-off questions or thoughts, ideas, suggestions, feedback, whatever it may be, you know, feel free to communicate with me there. If you want to connect with me on social media, just simply Google David DeCell, D-E-C-E-L-L-E, and all my social links will populate there. Uh, the one I'm most active on, the frankly, I think I have the most fun on and it's the most humanizing platform is Instagram, You know, whether it's regular posts or stories. So it gives us a lot of opportunity to get to know one another and interact with one another. So feel free to follow me on there. And if you want to check out the Model FA and how we may be able to help you in your business growth, you can simply visit us at modelfa.com. So we're going to be now transitioning to the after hours portion. And in the meantime, Alan, really appreciate your time today. I got a lot out of it. So I'm sure the other listeners got a lot out of it, but grateful for the time spent today, man. Yeah, likewise. Enjoyed it. Hopefully we'll be back one day. Awesome. Take care, everyone. Cool. You mentioned that you're one of the first or the first, I, I don't know, but most people are going to be charging the people who want to sell their business for the transaction, as you mentioned, you know, the investment banks and whatnot. What made you think of or come up with the idea to go in the other direction and really only get compensated by the buyer as opposed to the seller themselves? I didn't really think of it. I more, I stumbled upon it and it was simply my time with United. You know, Joe Duran, who, you know, I love, he's he's not much older than me, but I kind of think of him like as a father figure. He's a, definitely a mentor in my life. And that was the route that we chose with them. So all the years at United, I never was an employee for United. Okay. We were an independent contractor, but they were my only client. So I did that for a solid seven years before I even knew the term buyer advisor really was a thing. You know, it's it's not uncommon in the MA landscape. There are plenty of buyer advisors. I don't know of any other that's solely devoted to the wealth management space. There could be one. I just, I don't know who they are. I've looked. Yeah. But when we sold to Goldman Sachs, more or less the show was over for us doing any more acquisitions. So I thought, well, it worked so well for United. It's going to have to work for other firms too. There's got to be right. a number of firms who want to grow by acquisition, but they don't have the internal M&A team. They don't know how to run the process and they might be interested to work with us. So when I left that was actually one of the things I was most worried about, you know, because in all the transactions that we did, I think we did 30, some 33 transactions for United. Every time there was a press release, it was Joe Duran or Matt Brinker or someone like that who was in the press release describing uh, you're it. You're behind you're kind of the in scenes. The background. Yeah, so <laughs> no one really knew we existed. So I thought, wow, I would either go to flop or it's going to be a home run. And so far it's taken off. I mean, we're easily doubly as busy as we were ever in the days of United Capital. So love it. So you were working at like you had your own firm and you were contracted by United. Is that how it worked? But you basically, lack of a better way to put it, maybe exclusively worked with them at the time or what was that? Yeah. No, I, when it started, it was literally just myself. As I mentioned, I knew Joe because he talked to us about buying our firm years ago. Yeah. But he didn't he didn't want to buy it because we were buying accounting firms. But we stayed in touch over the years and I sold it in 2009 and uh, took a year and a half off and decided, hey, I'm going to get back into the business and went out to the uh, Schwab conference, which is where we had custody before. I thought, hey, I'll get I'll go see what's going on since the year and a half that I've been off. And I was standing in the vendor hall and I was thinking to myself, I bet Joe Duran is here. And he just walks right in front of me, not, <laughs> not 15 seconds later. And so I called my wife and I was like, you're not going to believe who just walked in front of me. And, you know, I grabbed them and we talked and she said, Alan, you know, this is like the third time that you've had the opportunity to do something with Joe. I think God's telling you something. You might want to pay attention to that. So he took a leap of faith in working with me, but we structured it as an independent contractor. So I started with myself and over the years, we built it up to a team of like eight people. Nice. So must be a fun journey. And I mean, I get energy from connecting people and that's what you're doing and getting compensated for it, you know, pretty well. So it must be a fun ride. It is. You know, this is when someone builds a practice, they're in their team, you know, it's like it's their life work in most cases. And so when they're thinking about this, 
it will probably be the biggest transaction financially they ever do. Right. Uh, and not only is it a big financial transaction, but they have their team that they love and care about. They have their clients. They it's love and care about. Too. Their identity is huge attached. Amount of, a huge amount of emotion. Even with the most analytical guys, when they get to that point of actually doing a deal, the emotions come out. And I don't know, we call it the freak out point. We don't know when that freak out point is going to happen. It's gonna... Sometimes it happens early, sometimes it happens late, but we know it's coming and we just have to be ready to catch them and and let them know it's going to be okay. You know, having done so many, you know, we can point to a lot of success to make them feel a sense of comfort, but it's definitely something we take seriously, understanding the gravity of the transaction. Well, you're probably serving as their consultant, serving as, you know, their M&A transactor, serving as their psychologist, best friends, et cetera. So a couple of... All of them, yeah. They, They keep in touch with me. Love it. Well, like you said, it was, you know, probably going to be the biggest transaction of their life. So, you know, it's good to stay in touch beyond that. So it doesn't feel like a transaction per se. Yeah. Felt yeah. Like we we say terms like transaction and things like that, because, you know, from a legal perspective, that's right. what it is. But it's really, it's a decision to, to move into a different world, you know, and it's a really big one. And so it takes a lot of care. It takes, I mean, average time it takes to get one of these done is usually around five to seven months. So it's yeah. not something that you flip a switch and do, you know. Right. Cool. Few, uh, few would you rather questions that I'm going to throw at you just okay. to get you thinking. First one is fairly morbid. So don't worry, we'll liven it up a little bit afterwards. But <laughs> so the first one is, would you rather know when you're going to die or how you're going to die? Man, you know, that's a great <laughs> question. <laughs> I, I, last night, literally, I was dreaming about this. So it's funny that you asked this wow. question. Wow. <laughs> Serendipity. I think I would like to know when I was going to die, not how. The how could freak me out, you know, if it was something tragic. You know, I don't, I wanna, I don't want to see that one coming. But maybe knowing like when it was going to happen would help me be able to plan or prepare better for my loved ones and such. But I'm not interested if I'm going to get hit by a bus or get choked out on the street somewhere. I don't want to know that. Well, that's <laughs> the thing, you know, if it's like a car accident or something like that, it's like every time you get in the car, you're like, this it? That's right. <laughs> <laughs> would you, so I feel strongly about uh, my answer here. I'm curious to hear yours. Would you rather lose the ability to read? or lose the ability to speak? Oh, wow. That's a good one too. That's one that kind of requires some thought. I think, so you didn't say lose the ability to see, just the ability to read. Yeah. I think I would uh, lose the ability to read because if I kept the ability to see and hear, I could do audio books and maybe watch movies and things like that. But yeah, I think I'll go with the, lose the ability to read. So, I felt strongly the opposite, but I'm now convinced the other way. So I guess it wasn't that strong because I was thinking if I can still read, I can still learn. And this is so silly of me because I don't read books. I listen to books. And the immediate immediate thing that came to mind is if I can't read, I can't learn anything. But you just debunked that for me. So I appreciate (laughs) that. I would agree. And then finally, would you rather never have to wait in line? or always have a parking spot, no matter where you went? Oh, easily not have to wait in line. I hate waiting in lines. Like I've, that's something I'm known for amongst my friends and family is the, my impatience with stuff yeah, like that. Antsy. You know, if I, I get in a grocery line or something like that, and I'm literally counting the seconds of how fast the person is moving the food across the whatever the conveyor belt is yeah so standing in line i hate waiting in line so that's easy one for me one more bonus one because i was just scrolling and i saw this and i would say either way i'd be screwed just because you know from college life all the way through now and my professional life and personal life but would you rather have all of your google searches or all of the photos on your phone made public (laughs) (laughs) i'm incriminated either way i answer yeah Um, could never run i would could never run for president (laughs) right i would probably go with google searches most of my stuff's pretty boring that i'm searching for Mm -hmm. and i don't know all the pictures that are on my phone so my you know i'll go with google searches because i think i'll be a lot a lot safer on that one there might be an incriminating 
a photo or something on my phone. I'm not aware yeah, of Yeah, the same. When I was in college, I, like my uncles always tell me, you know, when they were in school, they're like, yeah, none of this stuff got documented. And, you know, when I'm in college, like everything got documented. So right. uh, definitely <laughs> some incriminating stuff in there. So appreciate you having fun here towards the end yeah, and the after hours. And uh, for everyone listening, appreciate you sticking around. Hopefully you got a couple laughs. Hopefully you got uh, you thinking as well with some of those would you rather questions. And Alan, I know we have a professional relationship, you know, set up, but it's nice to also work on mine and yours personal relationship in our prior call and today. So grateful for your time and thank you for spending some time with us. Yeah, I love it. I had a great time. Appreciate it. And uh, look forward to getting to know you better. Awesome. Take care, everyone.